Good morning. Thank you for uh, being here today. I want to welcome everyone from all of our campuses here in uh, the United States. We're we're streaming to our Riverdale campus, to our Stewart's Creek campus, to our College Grove campus. And so uh, I want to welcome all of you guys uh, for being here this morning. Thank you for being here uh, today. Uh, You know, uh, when an NFL player gets injured, he goes on injured reserve. They take him out of action for uh, however long he needs to be out of action uh, so that he can heal properly. Uh, Then when he's ready, he comes back and he sort of eases in on a pitch count uh, so he doesn't re-aggravate the injury. And, you know, that's that's really what I've been, where I've been for the last 10 weeks. I've been on emotional IR, IR is injured reserve. I've been on emotional IR as I've been uh, dealing with the absolute worst uh, 10 weeks of my life, uh, trying to process, grieve, heal uh, Amy's death, and uh, it's been absolutely what you would think it would be, uh, and probably worse, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I have buried my uh, grandparents. I have buried my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. I buried my dad two years ago, and to be quite honest with you, I buried my mom this past year as well. And uh, all of those uh, were easy days. Those were easy days compared uh, to losing Amy. I mean, I I loved them all. I grieved them all, but they were my family. Uh, But Amy was my one. Amy was my one, and and it's a whole different level of uh, of grieving. And, uh, you know, many ask me, "Are, are, are you ready uh, for this Sunday, this week, or are you ready to preach? And my response has been, I don't really honestly know if I'm ready, uh, but it's time. But to be quite honest with you, when I woke up this morning, uh, uh, I, the heaviness that I felt today, I, I didn't really anticipate that level of heaviness. So I don't know if it's time, but I'm here. And I do think it's time. I think it's time for the healing process, another step in the healing process. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do believe it's time, but I, I want to ask you, uh, church, to please, and I know you will, but I want to ask you to bear with me. Uh, there are triggers everywhere, especially today. Uh, I, I, my heart has not beat as fast as it's beating right now, probably since the very first sermon that I preached. And and the thing that got me through that sermon when I was probably 20 years old was Amy sitting in, on the front row. Uh, and so I ask you to bear with me. There are triggers everywhere. Uh, and not just today, but for the foreseeable future, there's going to be triggers. And so I might look over where Amy sat. Uh, I might smell a perfume that was very similar or a perfume that Amy wore. I, I might see someone that has a coat or someone that's dressed in her style, I, anything. That's what I've learned, anything. I can, I can be driving down the road and see a tree and, and just it, it triggers something uh, because there's something there with me and Amy. And so uh, for the foreseeable future, there are gonna be triggers everywhere. And so if I'm preaching or if you're with me and I just have to stop and have just an emotional moment, just bear with me. I, I could be preaching on something completely unrelated. And, and so just please bear with me. I know you will. I promise if it's too much, I'll back out uh, for a while because I won't put you through that. Uh, but if you'll just bear with me, uh, that would be great. I know you will. Uh, I also, you know, I, I, uh, I usually don't preach with notes. You know that. If you've been here for a while, I, I, I usually don't preach notes. I, I study, I prepare, uh, and I, I like to preach to you face-to-face. I, I like to preach to you through study and preparation, and then on Sunday, let the Holy Spirit do with that what he does. But uh, to be quite honest with you, I'm probably for a while going to have to rely on some notes because uh, I don't have the emotional or the mental capacity yet to uh, stay focused, I don't think, uh, for the length of time. And I know my sermons are really short normally, but... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I have the um, emotional capacity or the psychological capacity, mental capacity to stay focused for any length of time. So that's going to be different. Lots going to be different about me, folks. I, I'm not the same man I was 10 weeks ago. That man's never coming back. Uh, and I don't know all that means yet, right? Uh, and so, uh, uh, so you know, I just, uh, 
you know, uh, bear with me through these things, if you will. You know, when Amy died uh, 10 weeks ago, uh, today, actually, uh, I immersed myself in the book of Job. I, honestly, <laughs> who wants to study the book of Job, right? I didn't want to study the book of Job. I mean, Job's about suffering. Uh, we don't want to talk about suffering. We want to avoid suffering at all costs, right? And so I, who wants to meditate on it, right? Let alone, uh, uh, you know, we want to avoid it. I don't, I don't want to meditate on suffering. And so I, I've really never been drawn to the book of Job. And, uh, uh, but I knew that God's word deals with everything we go through in life. And Job is probably the best place to go if you want to see a man who's suffering and questioning and how he dealt with it. And so I, I dove into the book of Job. And to be quite honest with you, it wasn't unsettling at all. It was very comforting. Uh, after I got through with the book of Job, and it took me uh, a while as I journaled and wrote and let God speak to me through the book of Job, I, I went to Philippians. And uh, the reason I went to Philippians is because Philippians is called the book of joy. And what makes it so uh, amazing is that Paul wrote about joy, and he didn't write about joy when he was sitting on a beach uh, with his toes in the sand and his family by his side and a bank full of money and, you know, a healthy uh, report from the doctor and, you know, no worries at all. He wrote about joy while he was suffering in prison. After he had been beaten and left for dead, like roadkill in a ditch somewhere and uh, I mean, ran out of town after town, uh, it, it, uh, you know, lied about in prison. He wrote about joy while he was suffering. I needed that. I wanted that. And so I said, I, I'm going to dive into the book of joy. And so today, uh, what I want to do basically today is I'm going to do what they call in the music world a mashup. You know, when a country artist and let's say a, a hip hop artist come together and do a song like Nelly and Tim McGraw or something, I, I'm sort of going to do a mashup between Job and, and Philippians. And, and it's not going to be a verse by verse thing. What I want to do is just sort of share with you in hopes that uh, it will challenge you and be of comfort and peace to you and help you to heal too. Uh, uh, I want to share with you some things that as I studied both of those books, that, that God uh, has really impressed upon me uh, during the last 10 weeks. And, and by, no, by no means is this all. It's just three things that I said, man, I, I want to share this with the church my first Sunday back. And so, uh, man, I, I, I want to re start by reading Philippians 1, uh, verses 3 through 5. And uh, here's what uh, Paul told the Philippians. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. You can imagine as I read that, immediately I'm thinking about remembering Amy and being thankful. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I read this passage, I went to this passage in immense grief. And as soon as I read this passage, uh, in my grief, I began to pause and say, God, I, 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 I'm thankful for some things, and, 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 and I want to uh, write these things down. I, want to, I need to remember these things. I need my mind to be set on some things that I'm very thankful for, because right now, I, I, I'm just upset. I'm, I'm angry. I'm, I'm lost. I'm, I'm, I'm wounded. I'm hurt. I'm in grief, and I, I, I need to be reminded of what I'm really thankful for. And so the first thing that, that I, I really began to be thankful for uh, here, I don't know if it was the first thing, but one of the things was my church, my, my covenant community, my friends, my family. You know, that's what Paul said. Paul had joy in the midst of all this suffering. While he was in prison, while he uh, was suffering, and while he was being beaten, he had joy. And the scripture tells us, God, for posterity, for all history's sake, he wrote down that I have joy because of my partnership in the gospel, my partners in the gospel. And who was he talking about these partners? It was his family, specifically his family, and specifically the church in Philippi, the covenant community in Philippi. You know, I, I, you can't talk about Job without talking about his friends. If you studied Job, then you have talked about Job's friends, right? I mean, everybody talks about Job's friends. They're infamous Right? They're infamous. Why? Because everybody says Job had terrible friends. 
because Job's friends, they told him when they came to see him, remember Job uh, lost his, his, his kids. He lost his livestock, which was his wealth, and he lost his health, boils all over him, scratching himself. Uh, I, I, he had lost pretty much everything, and he was one of the wealthiest and greatest men, and he lost it all. And his friends came to see him, and, and, and we say they're terrible friends. Most people say that they're infamous, so they have this reputation of just being terrible friends because they looked at him and they said, Job, you've lost everything. Obviously, you have some hidden sin. You have some hidden sin in your life, uh, and that's why God did this. It's sort of like a health and wealth preacher, isn't it? I mean, if you have enough faith, then God will be good to you, and if you struggle somewhere, then God's gonna get you. And, 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 and so if you'll prove your faith by giving me money, right? And so it's sort of like that, but they were saying, Job, you've got some hidden sin. That's why God did this. And so we think they're terrible friends, right? I, as I studied this, it dawned on me I don't think they were terrible friends at all. I think Job had great friends, ignorant friends, but great friends, okay? I think they were ignorant as all get. They were ignorant as any health and wealth preacher you've ever heard, but they were good friends. Why? Uh, listen, listen, I mean, to what Job 2, 11 through 13 says. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Uh, uh, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, Zophar the Naamathite, and they made an appointment together. They got together, we got to go see Job, to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Does that sound like bad friends to you? I mean, your friends hear that you're in pain, and what do they do? They immediately come to your side. And, 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 and they didn't, they saw him in a distance, and when they saw how in distress he was, when they saw the grief, when they saw the pain on his face. I mean, he's lost his kids, he's lost his wealth, he's lost his, his, his health, he's lost it all, and he's in such grief, and he could care less, believe me, about his wealth and his livestock at that moment. All, his kids were what was the, the crux of it all. And, and in, they saw him and they broke. Man, they wept. They, they, they put dust on their head and they tore their clothes, which was a sign of mourning. And, and they did this. And it says that they sat with him for seven days in silence, didn't say a word. Folks, that's not bad friends. That's good friends. They showed up. Now, when they did speak, they were ignorant. Biblically, they didn't have good theology. But I believe that they spoke those things out of a, con a sincere concern for him. They legitimately, in their mind, believed the health and wealth preachers of their day. They legitimately, in their mind, believe that if he would have been good, God wouldn't have done this. You know, it's, it's a retribution type thing. It, it, they, the, God's done this because they've been horrible. They believe that, and so they were telling him this because they legitimately thought, I believe, that if he would just confess, if he would repent, God would restore him. So they were ignorant biblically, but they were good friends. And I began to say, God, thank you for putting the friends in my life, and thank you that they're not ignorant. <laughs> thank you that they, they're, they're just here. When I got home from the hospital and I told you the story about how I had to go and uh, uh, because of my heart, and, uh, you know, I, my heart was beating 240. My max heartbeat's like 160. After that, it's like, you know, <laughs> see you later, buddy. But mine was at 240 for over an hour. 220, 240, I forget, Dallas. Uh, over an hour. When I got home from the hospital, my house was packed with people, friends, family, church, it was packed for days. The great thing is, is they were there. They didn't try to offer me theological advice. They didn't say, oh, Pat, don't worry, Amy's in heaven, which would have been perfectly accurate theological advice. But see, they knew in that moment, I'm like, I know she's in heaven, but I want her here right now with me. So that will comfort me one day, but today, I want her here. They didn't say, oh, Pat, God's got a will. God's got a plan. And you don't, yeah, I know, but his plan is obviously not for her to be with me. And one day that'll bring comfort to me, but not today, it doesn't. You know, sometimes the greatest thing to do is just be there and say nothing. 
Just be there and say nothing. That's what they did. They were just there. I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes I would look at someone, I would say, this sucks. And they would say, it sucks bad, Pat. That's what they would say. I, I kept repeating, I don't know what to do. I still don't know what to do. But I just kept repeating it. I did, and they would say, you don't need to know what to do. The only thing you need to do right now is the next right thing. Get up in the morning and pray. Get in your word. Eat. Go to bed. Take your meds. That's what you do right now. You don't need to know what to do. You see, they would have wanted to carry my weight, but they couldn't carry my weight. Nobody could carry that. Only I could carry it. Only my kids could carry it. But they carried me. They carried me through it. They were there when I went to bed. They were there when I got up. My family, I, I, I thank God for my, my, my family. I had nothing for my kids. My grown kids are grown. They process. I've got teenagers, Jaden, Ali, Kate, Isaiah. I had nothing for them. I had no advice for them. I had no comfort for them. I couldn't gather them around and put my arm. I couldn't do it. I had nothing. Rather than me carrying them, they carried me. My grown sons literally carried me to bed. My teenagers wouldn't let me sleep alone. They slept with me. Jaden kept saying, Dad, I know this is hard. It's the hardest thing we'll ever do, but we'll get through it. God will get us through it. My family came. They were there. This church showed up. You have been there. This church has fed my family every night since October the 30th, except for Christmas night and maybe two other nights. Someone from one of our campuses, Riverdale, College Grove, Stewart's Creek, someone has brought food to my house, which I'm thankful for because, man, we're just door dashing it. Uh, gift cards to restaurants. Cards, notes, people doing things, coming to my house, cleaning out my cabinets, cleaning out my closets, cleaning my house. This church has showed up. There's been zero pressure on me to get back in the, in the, in the game. Zero pressure from this church. You have allowed me patience and time to grieve, to cry, to question. I, I'm so, when I think of partnerships in the gospel, and God began to remind me of the people he's put in my life and specifically my covenant community, the church, there's no way I would have made it through the last 10 weeks and I still have a long way to go without my covenant community, the church. There's no way. I don't know how people do it without the church. People think they have community there's many reasons why I think people today are, you know, sort of lackadaisical in their commitment to church. And I think people think they have community. Maybe it's a travel ball community. And yeah, they're there for a moment. I mean, you have this community at work. Yeah, they'll send you, hey, sorry. They might be there for a moment. The church is your family. The church is your community. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so amazed that I recently read a stat that like 66.7, two out of every three Christians. Uh, especially, I think it's heavier, under 40. Two out of every three don't attend church at least once a month that claim to be Christian. I, I'm, that, that blows my mind. Folks, I, I just, I wanna challenge you. I, I wanna share with you what's on my my heart, but I want to challenge you in honoring Amy, what was important to Amy and what's important to me. And I want to ask you a question. It's like, if you really believe what you say you believe, and Amy is in heaven right now, 
in the presence of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She is there because she surrendered to him. That's the only thing, the most important thing in life. And if we really believe that, I cannot fathom nor can I understand how I can believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior, my hope, my only hope for eternity with God in heaven. And I'm like Sadesical in my commitment to his bride, his body, the church. I cannot fathom that. And some of the things I'm even more passionate about today, I cannot fathom that. I hope that this experience that I'm going through and that you're going through, please let it bring clarity into your mind about being committed to his church. Folks, I I didn't want to be here. There's been few Sundays in 10 weeks that I've wanted to be here. My kids, it's been tough, but we haven't missed a Sunday. And I don't say that to say, oh, look at me. I say that to say it's because of a commitment Amy and I made. This is what we believe. This is his body. We're committed to his body in the good times and in the bad times. Please, church, please let this be bring clarity to you about your commitment to his body. And I'd love for you to watch online when you're at work, when you have to work, when you're on vacation. Oh, we love that. But a consistent diet, just watching online at home is not how God designed the church to be. It's for you to be present. It's for you to be involved. And when you can't sing, don't sing. Let somebody else sing for you. I haven't sung in 10 weeks hardly. It's not just, oh, are you committed? I'm thankful for my church. I'm committed to my church. Please be committed to your church. Here's here's something else I'm thankful for, and I didn't put these in any order, and this is obviously at at the very top. I'm thankful for my God. I'm thankful for my God. Over and over in the midst of his suffering, Job was comforted by the sovereignty of God. He was comforted by the sovereignty of God. Not one person in this room wants to suffer. Some of you are suffering right now, just like me and my kids. But not one of us want to suffer. Man, we don't want to be driving through life and take a right turn on the road of suffering. Nobody. We want to avoid that road. We don't want to suffer. But see, folks, here's the problem. We can't avoid it. No one can avoid it. You're either suffering now or you will suffer soon because of sin and because of the brokenness in our world. And if you believe that suffering, if you believe that getting a bad medical report, and you will one day, if you believe that losing your kid, losing your your, uh, friend, losing your mom or your dad, losing a spouse, if you believe that a spouse being unfaithful, which is all these things are suffering, and I can go on and on, if you believe that these things happen randomly, that suffering just happens, then you are going to be bitter, and you are going to be cynical, and it's going to destroy you. I spent hours imagining all the things that I could have done to prevent Amy's heart from stopping. Hours. She probably, as I told you, she collapsed in the shower. She probably laid in the shower for 30 to 45 minutes before she was discovered. What if I'd have been there? You know, my kids were upstairs getting ready. They had no clue. I was here at church. I had no clue. She was all by herself in the shower. What if I'd have been there? What if my kids, you know, would have been right there with her? What if we'd have seen her? What if we'd have been all having breakfast? What if we would have seen her collapse and she would have been able to to receive immediate aid? You know, especially I watched Monday Night Football this past week and I saw DeMar Hamlin collapse immediately. When I saw him collapse, I saw the replay. Uh, I told uh, Ryan Garrett, who was watching it with me, I said, he didn't have a concussion. He had a cardiac arrest. He didn't have a concussion. He didn't get hit in the head. He had a heart attack. And you see them doing CPR for nine minutes on the guy. Uh, they're, they're, they're doing all this stuff and, you know, the, the, the paramedics. Uh, and, I mean, he's not breathing. His heart's not uh, beating. They do CPR today. The guy's alive and he is tweeting out and he's Instagramming out. And I'm going to be honest. What if Amy would have had that, right? What if Amy would have had that kind of aid? 
Why did she have that aid? Why did it happen when I was at church rather than me being right beside of her? Why? She had been very sick for three weeks leading up. If you saw her, you wouldn't have known it because that's the way she was. She had been very sick because they had changed some of her meds because she had two autoimmune diseases. She had Steele's disease, which is a rare disease. She had Graves' disease. They had changed some of her meds and and. and and it, it, it was making her, the adjustment was really making her sick. And the doctor said, you're gonna, she's got to level out. And she was over three weeks getting better with it and about to level out. But she'd been very sick, which included nausea, being very nauseated. So she had thrown up a lot. We were on elder retreat the week before she died. She calls me on Wednesday night. And, you know, I could tell she was very uh, disturbed. And she was asking me basically how to use the ECG on her watch. Uh, because her heart, her chest was hurting. Uh, I begged her to go to the hospital, to go, go to the emergency room. I'm coming home. She talked me into not uh, uh, go to the emergency room. No, I, I'm okay. I think, you know, and, and I called Seth. I said, Seth, you get to the house now. You talk your mom into going to the, to the ER, put her in the car, do what you got to do. She's stubborn, you know. That was Amy. I told her, I trust you with your health because she was the I mean, the health, I mean, man, everybody had questions. They couldn't talk to their doctor to call an Amy. I said, I trust you with your health, but I please beg you to go. She didn't go, but she made it through the night, went to the doctor. Great. She saw the nurse practitioner. The nurse practitioner said it was musculoskeletal. She probably pulled something as she was uh, throwing up, and her chest made sense because of the way the pain was. It actually had gotten better by Saturday, so it made sense. But what if... What if she would have went to the ER on Wednesday night? What if she would have went, and you know they would have done an EKG, and they would have done, what if she would have went, and then they would have discovered something, and, and they said, oh, we've got to do this now, and it would have saved her life. What if? What if this would have happened? You know, if it's random, you what if, woulda, coulda, shoulda, did something. There's no purpose. Job 42, 1 and 2 says this. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job knew losing his kids, losing his health, losing his livestock wasn't random. Most of us have lost someone. It wasn't random. Nothing is random. God is in control of every atom in the universe, of every molecule, of every cell. God is in control of every heartbeat. If God would have wanted to, he could have saved Job's kids. Nothing would have happened to Job's livestock. Nothing would have happened to Job's health because God has the power to do that. Nothing can thwart God's plan. Nothing can thwart God's will. He is in control, and he is sovereign. Job 1, 21, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't say the Lord gave and, oh, man, I, she just died. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. The Lord has taken away. This was God. God's in control. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Do you see what the psalmist says? Every day of your life, every day was formed, the first, the last, and every one of them before one came to be. Before your birth date, your death date was established, written in stone, set, nothing you can do. I've got news for you. Are you workout buffs? And I'm glad you work out. You can run every day, 10, 12 miles a day. And I hope you do. You will not live one moment longer 
because you work out, because of your diet. Just, I want you to have the proper perspective. You will feel better if you eat right and if you work out. You will not live one moment longer. Your death date is established now. Nothing. As John Piper says, you are immortal until that, that moment comes. As the pastor I had in Greenville, Texas said, son, nothing will take you. I, I remember when I was in Greenville, Texas, and this was 30-some years ago. This was when HIV AIDS was just really new, and I, I, everybody was scared. And I was like, he went to the hospital to see someone. Everybody at that moment was gloving up, mask, I mean, you know, putting hazmat suits on to go in and see someone who had HIV AIDS. And he, he just walked right in with nothing on. And I'm like, what are you doing? He said, I'm ministering, son. And I said, are, is that? He said, son, let me, let me make sure you understand something. Until God's through with you, nothing will take you out of this world. When God's through with you, bye-bye. Nothing will keep you here. Every one of your days were formed before one of them came to be. Job 12, 9 and 10. Who among all these... Job said, does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. The hand of the Lord has done this. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. God holds your life. God holds your breath. He's in control. Job 14, 5, since his days are determined, his days are determined and the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. I can go on and on, but do you begin to see what Scripture teaches? Scripture teaches that your birth date and your death date were set before the world began. You're not random. Your life is not random. I can play the what-if game for the rest of my life. I can imagine the thousands of ways that I could have changed that day. But Amy didn't just die. It wasn't random. And it wasn't without purpose. DeMar Hamlin lived. It wasn't random by the luck of the draw. Oh, he's just happened to be on the football field with, with all the medical personnel at, at his disposal immediately just a few feet away. Amy was in the shower by herself. Just so random. It wasn't random at all. It wasn't random at all, and it wasn't without purpose. I don't know it, and I can't see it, but I believe it because God said it. God ordained that Amy Nunley would be born on May the 25th, 1966 in Kingsport, Tennessee. He ordained before the world began that she would grow up in Church Hill, Tennessee, he ordained that she would be saved. He ordained that she would marry this crazy, wild redhead and be committed to him in covenant marriage for 37 and a half years. God ordained that. He ordained that she would have five kids that she loved, as she said, more than peanut butter. He ordained that. He ordained the specific five kids. They're not by the luck of the draw. He ordained that she'd have, the day she died, that she would have two incredible daughters-in-law, that she would have three grandkids that she absolutely adored. He ordained that she would be the greatest pastor's wife I've ever seen, one of the greatest women's Bible teachers that I know. He ordained that she would have an incredible impact on this world. I cannot tell you the messages, the text that I've received from people that said, we have our kids because of Amy. Our kids are no longer orphans because of Amy. We adopted because of Amy. God ordained that she would have this impact on the world. And oh man, God gave. And Job also said, would we trust God in, in the good times? That's what he told his wife, and not trust him in the bad times. But see, God also ordained that on October the 30th, 2022, her heart would stop beating. 
somewhere between 8 and 8.30 on Sunday morning when her husband would be at church and her kids would be upstairs. And she would be all by herself. God ordained that. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Every one of her days were established before one of them came to be. Her limit was set before the world was created. Don't believe for one moment the ignorant health and wealth preachers that you see on TV that I don't even know if they're saved because you can't read the Bible and just misinterpret it to that point. You have to absolutely torch the Bible to get what they get out of it. Don't believe them that your, God, that, that, that your health depends on how, how, you know, your faith and, and your health. And, and, and if you've got enough faith, you'll just be, you, you, you know, don't, don't believe that junk. In all honesty, if I'm truly honest with you, if I saw probably you're, you're the most famous health and wealth preacher in the world, maybe many of yours, the only thing that would keep his nose healthy would be my faith, not his, because he's a liar to you. If that's what I believed, I would be angry today. And I am at, at those health and wealth preachers, but not at what's happened. At Amy's funeral, Kyle, who did a marvelous job, asked all the women in the room, and it was packed. Thank you for honoring Amy that way. But it wasn't just packed in the house. Thousands and thousands of people watched online. Amy asked every woman in the room who had been impacted by Amy to stand, and every woman in the room stood. But I went home, and a few weeks later, I went to Facebook to watch the, the funeral again myself, some of it, as much as I could. And I started reading the comments. And there were women, not only in the room, but all over the United States and all over the world. I cannot name, I can't tell you the number of countries that women put, I'm standing in Mexico. I'm standing in Belgium. I'm standing in Thailand. I'm standing in uh, France. I'm standing in Canada, all over the world. People said, I'm standing. Women said, I'm standing. She had this incredible impact on the world. And I loved her with every fiber of my being. And I can't for the life of me understand how a woman with that kind of impact, God would take can't get it. I loved her with every fiber of my being, but here's what I know. God loves her more than I do. She didn't die just some random death on some random day. God took her. I don't know why, but it was in his plan. I'll never know why, but I don't have to. Because you see, I, I didn't create the world out of nothing. I didn't hang the stars in the sky. I don't tell the rain where to fall and where to not fall. I don't tell the wind where to blow and the lightning where to strike. I don't tell the animals where to bed down. But God does. He's in control. I can only see what is happening in the moment, but he sees every moment. He sees everything. He's sovereign, and that means Amy's death isn't random. It has purpose. I could have had the paddles ready to shock her heart. I could have had the most world-class heart surgeon on line or on at disposal waiting for her to collapse, and she wasn't coming back because it was her day. It was the moment that God had established and nothing can thwart God's plan. Nothing. 
folks, I, I, I told you this because I, I want to help you process because just like me, you're suffering or you're going to suffer. And that's why knowing the Bible is so important. God's word has given me peace that I would not find anywhere else. It has the answers that I wouldn't find. Research shows that people who read the Bible and engage in the Bible regularly are happier, they're healthier. That that might be something. Some of you might need to stop running and start reading the Bible if you want to be healthy. Their marriage is better. Their sex life is better. On and on and on and on. But most people who claim to be Christians never read the Bible. As a matter of fact, over 60% of people who identify as Christian don't read the Bible more than two times per year. Does that, again, just like church, does that even connect with you? If you're a Christian and you believe that God created you and you believe that your salvation depends upon God, you believe that the Bible is the word of God in our day and we neglect reading his word? I, I, I can't grasp that. We spend hours in our crazy, messed up world, looking for answers on the Google, on the internet. We'll spend hours trying to discover and read uh, how to deal with this issue and how to deal with that issue. And two times a year, six out of 10 Christians read the Bible. Folks, if you don't put God's word in your head, you're going to suffer greatly. Your kids are going to suffer greatly because they're not going to see you do it. It's not going to be important to you. It's not going to be important to them. I, I, I pray that you would make this year, I pray that you would make this a commitment. I, I've been going through Amy's Bible that I just got her not too long ago. And it's all marked up and it's brought comfort to me. Matter of fact, uh, Travis and Haley got me a gift for Christmas. Haley's a photographer, and it's a picture of me and Amy kissing on the beach. And they took out of her Bible, they found her handwriting, and they got it engraved exactly in her handwriting that says, my love for you will never be removed. Now, she wrote that in her Bible, and she, it was, it's a reference of God's love, but it was appropriate. They put it, me and her kissing, because it applied to me as well. And it's beautiful. Where did they get it? Her Bible. Are you committed to the Bible. We've got a daily reading plan. Please be committed to the word. Please be committed to his church. Make this the year that you commit. And the last thing that I, was, that I want to mention today I'm thankful for is my marriage. Marriage in general, but my marriage. What I'm going to say is probably going to blow some of your minds. I hope after they're blown, they come back together and go, oh, by the end of what I say about this. Paul was thankful for his partners in the gospel. I couldn't help in that day, in that moment, uh, but thank God for his beautiful mind conceiving a partnership in the gospel called marriage. I I was just so thankful for my marriage. If you're over 40 years old, then you've probably seen the movie Jerry Maguire. Raise your hand if you've seen it. Yeah, not, not a young person in the room. Well, there's one or two. Man, it was a great movie. And Jerry Maguire, or Jerry Maguire, Tom, it was just Tom Cruise. He had some quotes that just made the ladies melt, didn't he? I mean, you still remember those quotes, right? I mean... You had me at hello. Oh. But probably the most famous quote you remember was, you complete me. He told Renee Zilwiger, 
you complete me. Man, it was a great quote, wasn't it? But you see, I remember when I watched that, and I remember after, it had all the preachers all worked up. Some of the preachers got on a bully pulpit. Some of the preachers thought, oh, this is the problem with the world. You see, he promoted this fallacy when he said, you complete me. He promoted this fallacy that you can't be whole, complete, fulfilled, or happy without a spouse or without a woman, without a man in your life. Man, that sounds good, don't it? Because you see, they were trying to accentuate the point that only your deepest needs and, and, and desires can be met and fulfilled in Christ. Is that true? Yes. That's true, Okay. But they were trying to accentuate that point, and in doing so, I think they forgot the Bible because, uh, you know, they, they totally neglected the part, the point, which says, where God said, you're not complete without a spouse. Did you know that? I mean, it's in the opening pages of the Bible. When there was no sin, when Adam had an unhindered relationship with God, it was beautiful, it was perfect, and he and God communed, and they, I mean, man, he, he was completely fulfilled in his relationship with God, and God looked at him and said, Adam, you're not complete. It's not good for man to be alone. All you preachers that said, oh, you can't, we're, we're just dating the Lord. No, don't, that, that's weird. You see, God said, it's not good. God looked at Adam and said, it, 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 it's, it's, it, you're not complete. So what did God do? Made Eve. Now it's good. It's the only thing that wasn't good. Now it's good. He's got a wife. Now it's good. Now, I'm not devaluing being single if you're single. Please understand that. I'm trying to accentuate and value God's word on marriage and the importance and the beauty of marriage. I believe Paul does make allowance for remaining single. And when I'm talking about being single, I'm not talking about widows, widowers, people who are, I mean, that's been married. I'm talking about, you know, as, as you go through life, because you see, we live in this day and age to where people so devalue marriages, we don't need marriage today, right? In, in, in people's minds. And, you know, and some people say, well, maybe, you know, I'm just going to be single. And some, some it's, a, it's a complete, unbiblical, godless singleness where it's like, man, I'm just going to have fun and, and do everything. And I don't, I don't need to get married. I can still have sex with whomever I want and do everything. I can, you know, I, why do I buy the cow? I got the milk for free. All this kind of stuff. You know what I'm talking about. And then some of it's like, oh, maybe God's just called me to be single. I think God's called me to be single. I've heard that. And Paul does make allowance for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, here's what Paul said. I wish that you were all like me in referencing singleness. I wish that you were all like me. Why? So that you could give 100% of your money, 100% of your time, 100% of your occupation, 100% of your life to serving the Lord. So that if God says, go to China, you don't have to say, wait a minute, I've got my wife and I've got my kids and I can't. No, you have no hindrance. Wait a minute, you go quit your job here and do that. Well, I can't, I got... I wish you were like me, that you were just 100% devoted. So, so when somebody says, I'm called to be single, here's, it's a great test. Is 100% of your money, occupation, time, life, relationships, everything about serving the, serving the Lord? If so, bingo, you might be called to be single. Not monkery or nunnery, okay? But you might be called to be single. If not, you're not. We cannot get past God's word. We cannot get past God's word that it's not good. I've understood that my whole Christian life, but not like I do now. I'm not good without Amy Hood. It's not good for man to be alone. Marriage is beautiful. Marriage is important. Marriage is necessary. Oh, I know it now more than ever. It isn't two individuals living together. It's two individuals becoming one. It's a mystical, it's a spiritual experience where God brings two individuals and makes them one so that they can serve him together better than they could apart. They complete each other. That's what becoming, they complete. See, Jerry Maguire was good theology. They complete each other. It's not that you can't have a valuable and meaningful life 
when you are single. It's not. It, 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 it's, not when, it's not that you can't have a valuable and meaningful life when your one is gone like me. It's just that you're not complete without your one. It's just incomplete. I mean, I'm sorry. You can't get away from the Bible. That's why I've been on an emotional IR for the last 10 weeks. My one is gone. I'll never get over Amy. Never. I don't want to. But with the grace of God, I hope to get through it and one day be happy and joyful again. And one day have hope and peace again. One of the things that I grieved the most immediately, and this is what probably is going to blow your mind. One of the things that I grieved most after Amy died was the realization and the fact that it began to sink in that I would never be in a marriage relationship with that woman again. He said, oh, Pat, wait a minute. When you get to heaven, you, you know, y'all will be married for all eternity. Uh, I'm going to be with her for all of eternity. But you see, the Bible says there's no marriage in heaven. And some of you just went, what? Let, let me explain with Scripture. The Sadducees, they were this religious group. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They tried to trap Jesus. Their intention was to trap Jesus uh, and into something that they could use against him. So they asked him a question about the resurrection that they didn't believe in. And they said, hey, Jesus, we got a question for you. You see, they had this Leverite marriage, and that way, because women had no rights in their society, women were like dogs in that society, and you, you know back in the, uh, it wasn't a biblical society, it was the unbiblical society, and they didn't, and that's what Jesus came to restore, and, and so uh, the only way a woman was involved and, and could maintain any kind of status in society was to be married. And, and so the Leverite marriage was this. If you're married and your husband dies and he has a brother that's not married, then this brother, or he has a brother, the brother marries his brother's widow to provide offspring in his brother's name and for her to be connected in society. So they, they, that's the Leverite marriage. And so the Sadducees, they, oh, we're going to trap Jesus. We don't believe in this resurrection stuff anyway. So we're going to trap him here. And we got a, we got a question I don't think he can answer. <laughs> so here's what we do. All right. You know, our, our, our Leverite marriage, Jesus. So uh, this woman, she was married and her husband died. And she married his brother. Okay. He died. Well, she had, he had seven brothers. He married, she married the third brother. I'll be dog if he didn't die. And she went through all seven brothers. Oh, we got him now. Now, Jesus, let me ask you this. Whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? Boy, that's a question. I'm so glad they asked this question because that's a question a lot of you have. I mean, if you've been married more than once, you're thinking, <laughs> which one of these is going to be my wife in heaven? And let's be honest, you better not tell the, don't, don't say it. But you're praying it's this one and not that one. Right? Very relevant question for us, isn't it? And that's most of our world, most of our church. Been married more than once, whether it's, you know, divorce, whether it's death, whether it's, you know. You, so uh, we, who am I going to be married to, really? Who? Great question. Because, I mean, let's face it, man, uh, uh, <laughs> That's a, that, that, that's a real, so Jesus, you know what his answer was? 
<laughs> That's probably what he did. He said, you guys are absolutely flipping ignorant. Not exactly how he said it. But it really is. Here's what he said. You guys do not have a clue what the scripture says. That's ignorant, right? I don't know. You guys are ignorant. You don't know the scripture or the power of God. As a matter of fact, here's what he said in Matthew 22, 29, and 30. He said, Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scripture, you're ignorant. You're wrong, you're ignorant. Don't you just love Jesus? You know neither the scripture nor the power of God, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. We don't become angels. You know, Amy didn't get her wings, okay? Angels are created beings. He says we become like angels and that angels aren't married. All right, now I know this, this, this blows uh, uh, some of your mind. Jesus is clear, but I grieve this. I'm gonna be honest, I grieve. I loved Amy our marriage was so good. It was so awesome. I, I'll never have this again. I won't have, be in this relationship with you. I grieved it. Man, our marriage was so good. As, as broken as it was, it was so good. I can't imagine what it'll be in heaven in perfection. Our intimacy was so good. I can't imagine what it will be in heaven in perfection. I'm like, I'll never have that again. I grieved it. Man, I, 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 I processed in a Skype meeting with one of the world's foremost theologians this, this whole question. I dove in and I studied because I wanted to find some loophole. I wanted to find something where I could say, oh, wait a minute, there is marriage in heaven. And I, man, I, I, that's it. I wanted to, but I couldn't because it's not there. I grieved it. But then as I prayed, as I studied, and as I talked to theologians, and as I talked to, I, 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 I studied and I prayed, and here's why my perspective began to shift from losing marriage in heaven to the meaning of marriage on earth. That's a big shift. I was more concerned about my marriage to Amy in heaven, and God began to remind me of what marriage is on earth. You see, marriage was created for this life for multiple reasons and not for the next for multiple reasons. Marriage was created for this life because we have needs in this life. We have sexual needs. We have emotional needs. We have relational needs. We have psychological needs. We have security needs. We have all of these needs that can only be met on this planet in the covenant of marriage. That's why God created a helper. Not that she was subservient, but that she was necessary. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He's not subservient. But in heaven, folks, we have no needs. We have no sexual need. We have no, I know, I can't understand it. We have no needs, no emotional needs. We're not lonely in heaven. We don't need a helper. God also created marriage for a husband and wife to enjoy each other. And sexual intimacy is not just about procreation. It is about covenant renewal. Every time a husband and wife enjoys uh, intimacy with each other, it is about a covenant renewal, a worshiping of God and a covenant renewal. And I could go into that in more depth and then one day maybe I will, but it, it, it's not just procreation, but it is also how God planned in marriage for the earth to be populated and filled with kids who love and follow Jesus. It's how we are fruitful and we multiply. You see, marriage is what God created to overcome the curse of death uh, by bringing new life through birth. But in heaven, there will be no death. In heaven, it's populated not by birth, but by rebirth. That's how we get into heaven, rebirth, not birth. God also created marriage in this life for protection against sexual sin. 
That's why Paul said if you burn, get married in the same way when he said, look, don't, with passion, you got to get married, get a wife. Protection against sexual sin. In heaven, there's no temptation. There's no sin in heaven. Most importantly, there's other reasons. Most importantly, marriage is a picture of Jesus and the church. Marriage is designed to be the most intimate relationship. That's our relationship with Jesus, a fidelity. Jesus, our relationship with Jesus should be marked with fidelity, with commitment, with loyalty, with all of these things. That's what marriage is designed so people can look at that and say, that man is committed to that woman and she's committed to him. And wait a minute, I'm talking to you, Ephesians 5, about Jesus and the church, Paul said. Right? But in heaven, we don't need a picture. Our faith becomes sight. You see, Amy's had faith. Some things I can't understand. Now Amy's faith is sight. In heaven, we need a picture. I mean, on this earth, we need a picture, but in heaven, we have the reality. I agree because I can't imagine life without marriage or sex. And then I realized if I don't need marriage or sex, how great will that be? How great will that be? It's unbelievable. I believe the Bible's clear. Now, let me make sure to reassure you. We're going to know each other. Amy and I are going to know each other. We're going to celebrate our life on this planet together, I believe the Bible teaches. We'll celebrate our kids. We'll not only celebrate our kids. And when Amy died, we had five kids, two daughters-in-law, and, 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 and three grandkids. We have three teenagers that's not yet married that one day will have husbands, and, 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 and Isaiah will have a wife, and, and Lord willing, they'll have kids. Amy don't know who those daughters-in-law, uh, daughter-in-law and those sons-in-law will be, and she don't know those grandkids. But guess what? In heaven, we'll not only enjoy and celebrate the kids we have, uh, the grandkids we have, but the generations that we have. But when I die, I will not know if the Lord tarries the generations, but we will in heaven, and we'll celebrate all of that together. We'll celebrate our relationship here. We just won't have those needs that we have. And I grieve that. And then the Lord began to shift to the real purpose of marriage here on earth. And he began to help me to understand, although we won't know marriage in the way we know here, it won't be less than, it will be greater than. We will not miss anything. See, I can't, I can't get it on this side. I can't understand it on this side. My mind can't conceive it. But we won't miss anything because it'll be that good. So I want to challenge you today to commit yourself to marriage. Some of you right now are probably thinking about throwing in the towel. Please stop and consider what marriage is. If we as Christians could grasp what marriage is, if we could contemplate. Folks, I've done more introspection and contemplation in 10 weeks about Amy and our marriage and all the little petty stuff that we argued about, and we did, just like you. Stop and think about what marriage is. It's a sacred covenant that represents a picture of Jesus and the church. Breaking that covenant mars that image for the world and for your kids. Please stop and think about what marriage is. Now, there are a couple of biblical permissions for divorce. Marital unfaithfulness, abandonment. Those are biblical permissions. But even in a biblical permission, uh, uh, even in these permissions, they are permission, not commands. And so, therefore, if a spouse has been unfaithful, uh, before you just say, well, I've got a permission to get out of jail free card. I've got a permission now. Uh, there should be grace because you've committed spiritual adultery with Jesus, according to the Bible. And we have to think about that. And we have to pray and extend grace if we can. And if we can't, there are those two biblical permissions. But outside of these biblical commission, permissions, throwing your marriage in the trash is Outside of these is the worst decision you will ever make in this life. If you're not happy and you're trying to be happy, I promise you won't be happy with your next one either. You won't find happiness until you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 34. 
It's not a new spouse you need. It's a new relationship with Jesus, to be quite honest. I, I can't have my wife. I do not have that choice. Look at me, but you do. I can't have mine. But you can. And God can restore it and make it something you've never dreamed or imagined. I have zero, zero, listen to me, negative memories of Amy Hood. Zero. Oh, I don't think it's because our marriage is perfect or she was perfect. She wasn't perfect. I'm far from perfect. I'm way farther from perfect than her. We argued just like you do. We fought just like every married couple. That's not the reason I don't have zero negative memories. But no matter when we did fight, no matter how loud the explosion, when that smoke settled, when the smoke cleared, here's what I knew. Amy Hood's gonna be standing right there looking me in the face. There was never one moment of any 37 and a half years that we were married that either one of us questioned if the other was going to be there. I mean, we struggled. We, 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 we would argue. We had kid struggles and marriage struggles. We went through seasons just like you do, but there was never a question. And it wasn't because I guarantee you, Amy didn't think, golly, this guy doesn't make me happy today or this guy doesn't make me happy. It was because of a commitment. And let me make sure you understand, 37 and a half years in the last five years was the best years of our marriage. The last three years was the best. The last year was the best year of our marriage because it gets better and better and better if you're committed. And if you're dedicated, it gets better and better and better. We didn't stay together because we were e it was easy. We stayed together because we loved each other and we loved each loved the Lord with all of our heart and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. It takes you and her and the Holy Spirit. Today, I want to challenge you, folks. I, I, I want to challenge you. As I, as I, over the last three, 10 weeks, God's just impressed upon me the importance of the church, the importance of my God, and the importance of my marriage. I pray that God takes this message and challenges you I pray for revival in this church and awakening in this city. And I truly believe that that will happen if you are committed to your church, if you are committed to the word of God, and if you are committed to your marriage, I believe God will do something unimaginable. I pray that we go into the greatest years in our church's history. And I, I pray that it's because we committed and we are dedicated. I've got a long way to go with God's grace and with your grace. I truly believe we'll get there. And I believe our best days for this church are ahead. Please be committed to the word. Be committed to your church. Be committed to your marriage. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. God, you know my heart, you know my pain, and I thank you for letting me question. Thank you for letting me cry out. Thank you for understanding when I couldn't pray, when I can't pray, when I can't sing. Thank you that those things don't make you upset. They make you run to me because you are gentle and lowly, because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I pray for every person in this room watching online right now that will watch throughout the weeks and months. I pray, God, that Christians, people who claim you as their Savior, would understand what that means and implies, and that, God, Christians would say, God's Word 
is so important. I'm committing to it. I'm committing to it. I wanna know it because I'm going to suffer. God, I know this won't be the last time I suffer. God, your word is not just for suffering, but God, when I prosper, what do I do with it? God, when I have kids, what do I do? How do I raise them? God, when I don't have kids, when, when we can't have kids, how do we deal with it? God, when I lose my job, God, when I get married, your answer, your truth, your word, how do I deal with a culture that is so confused on what a man is, what a woman is? How do I deal with a culture? How do I deal with these things? God, your word, your word, your word, your truth is there. We neglect it and so we get confused. We neglect it and so our kids are confused because it don't pour out of our lives into theirs. We neglect it and our marriages are in shambles and we so easily eject because we don't know your word and we don't believe your word. And Lord, we wanna take it and manipulate it. God, I wanted to manipulate it so that I knew that there's, I'm gonna be married to Amy forever. And God, I thank you that I can't even, fat. thank you that now I know that I absolutely cannot fathom how good heaven's gonna be if I don't need marriage. And if I don't uh, need sex and marriage, I can't, blows my mind, God. Thank you for that. God, I pray, God, that we would be committed to your church, our attendance. We would be present. We would be committed to your word. How do we be committed to our marriage and see what you do in our lives? God, I pray for my family in this church. God, I wasn't ready to preach. I don't know if I'd have ever been ready. If I'd have waited till I was ready, I, I'd never do it. I don't even know if it was time, but God, I'm thankful that you gave me the strength. And I pray that this church, that your Holy Spirit would take the words and impart them into people's hearts and do what you will. In Jesus' name, amen.